as I predicted yesterday, I, I didn't wake up to front page news, or I didn't see on the six o'clock news last night. You know, TV One, the news readers in their nice suits or their their nice frocks saying. Wow, climate change predictions from the United Nations have been halved. We can all relax. Take a breather. Kick back. Get some petrol out of the ground. Go fossil fuel. No one said that. Um, And in fact, a whole lot of people came back at me on social media yesterday and said, oh, but the Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres, opened the COP conference in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, by saying we were at a tipping point we only had 10 months to do something, blah, blah, blah. Yep, of course he did. That's what they've been doing for years. That's what United Nations bureaucrats do. They talk rhetoric. But just amazing that Guterres does that when he has a report from his own organisation that says nothing to worry about. We can all calm the farm um, somewhat. So I have been, I've been amazed, to be honest, uh, at the la- well, you people have responded. The person in the, stri- in the street has responded, and we're getting response from a lot of people. Uh, but the official media line is no, no, no. How can we lose the ability to terrify all our listeners and readers and viewers? The world has to be ending. The planet has to be burning. Well, as I said and revealed yesterday and highlighted yesterday with Barry Brill, it just isn't, and it's not predicted to. The science says it's not predicted to. So if the climate crisis, the climate change crisis is over, what are we still doing pursuing policies that are meant to address a crisis that does not exist? Policies that often damage or cause huge huge disruption to our economy and to our lives. Well, one group that has reacted to our story is the ACT Party, and we sent details uh, of the Barry Brill piece, and, of course, uh, based on a UN report, uh, through to Simon Court, uh, ACT MP, and he joins us, um, looking very good, from Parliament, I think. Is that your flat, or is that Parliament you're in there, Simon? Oh, good morning, Sean. This is uh, this is my office in the old parliamentary library. Oh, OK. Act, it's a good-looking uh, spot. Nice-looking spot. Um, though for yeah, everyone thanks, reading, uh, listening, that means nothing. All right. I-, I bumped into you the other day. I said you should check out this UN report. Um, so we sent it through to you. What, what did you make of it? It's pretty good news, isn't it? Well, Sean, I read the report and uh, it actually reflects a lot of what I'm hearing when I go around New Zealand and meet people in the energy sector and the transport sector, that they're able to reduce emissions much faster than than anticipated simply through innovation. And that what they also tell me is a lot of the taxes, the bans and all of the government intervention through ECA and the, the different funds that they're handing out to companies actually not necessary. The private sector is already good, getting on with it and reducing emissions and this UN report um, this UN report actually has the evidence. Okay, and it halves the predictions for climate warming this century. Halves them. Surely that's got to have an impact globally in terms of policy and should have an impact here. I mean, I haven't did, but has our parliament voted for a climate emergency? Well, uh, the ACT Party voted against the climate emergency, Sean. Uh, I worked at Auckland Council when they declared a climate emergency, but they couldn't fix the wastewater to stop old landfills falling into the sea. It's all about virtue signalling. Now, when we go back and look at the, all of the predictions that were made about the range of scenarios that could happen to Earth in the next 100 years, when a politician like James Shaw or Guterres at the UN stands up and talks about the catastrophe, they're talking about the most extreme model, what they called RCP 8.5. And that's that four to five degrees of warming by the end of the century. It's clear we're on track for somewhere between one and a half and two and a half degrees, and that's what we should be adapting our infrastructure for, and that's what we should be targeting policy at. All right, so in other words, yes, we should rethink things like carbon neutral policies we should rescind and councils should rescind the climate emergency declarations they've made 
Well, the problem is what's occurring in an emergency is that everybody starts to respond like it's an emergency. They're reactive rather than thinking about what's good policy if we wanted to reduce emissions over time. And look, zero carbon 2050 is probably quite achievable. In fact, a lot of businesses, including the big yeah, energy why? companies, the oil and gas... Why? If there's no crisis, if there's not a problem that that solves, why? Well, I think what a lot of scientists do agree on is that it's good not to pollute the atmosphere. Yep. And so if you just start with this concept of polluter pays, reduce your emissions, do it at least cost, that's, a, that, that's actually something yeah. that big business can get behind. And in terms of options that we're going to have as commuters, the car companies who came to Transport Committee last year said, hey, you don't need to tax utes, you don't need to subsidise Teslas. By 2028, we're only going to be making EVs and hydrogen vehicles. So you're going to meet your targets without taxing yourselves yeah. into oblivion and, and putting four to six grand onto the price of a ute or, or, or a light van. And Act says, look, we don't need all those extra policies. We'd get rid of the Zero Carbon Act. We don't need to live as if it's an emergency. There's good policy out there um, that's actually having an effect and businesses are responding by reducing would emissions. You rescind the, so. Would you rescind the climate emergency if you were in government? Well, I'd be happy to vote to get rid of the climate emergency. Oh, you, voted against you it, can't get this past your caucus. Oh, look, Sean, we've said in the first 100 days we will get rid of the Zero Carbon Act. Now, that's the act that makes this whole thing an emergency. It gives the power to people like James Shaw and Michael Wood um, actually to start taxing industries, taxing utes, um, and putting and putting entire sectors uh, like the oil and gas sector out of business. We would get rid of the Zero Carbon Act in the first 100 days. Yep. That's one of our pledges. Okay, would you get rid of the climate emergency? Well, I'd vote, I'd, I'd vote to get vote. rid of the climate emergency, okay. Sean. So it's not something so we've talked no. about with that, our caucus. That, okay, that's okay. Talk about, I just might, might I suggest, heaven forfend, that you do talk, talk to them about that. Are you surprised that this revision, and the UN is like amongst the greenies, the gold standard, the IPCC says it, the UN says it, it must be true. Are you surprised this report, this, this halving of climate warming predictions hasn't had more media coverage. I'm just amazed because I think it's just such a fundamental change in the data we have uh, and, it, and something that has been affecting global politics and policy for so long. I, I cannot quite get my head around the fact that this isn't a bigger story. Well, I... I understand why it's not of interest to the mainstream media, sure. Why? Because if there's a because if there's a disaster or something's on fire or you, or you know there's a wildfire, the helicopters are up. That's six o'clock news. But if you listen to people like Bjorn Lomborg, who talks about our long-term progression using technology to solve problems like climate change, like flooding moving hundreds of millions of people out of flood-prone areas over the last 50 years. Places like Bangladesh, where millions of people used to die in floods every year. Now, hardly anyone dies in countries like Bangladesh. But that's not news, Sean, because that's the kind of incremental progress that, that the human race makes, using technology, working hard to solve problems. It doesn't make the six o'clock news. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, you're going to get rid of the Ute tax too, uh, uh, one texter asks. Will that be gone? Absolutely. Okay, Ute tax. Absolutely. As well. Not just not just the Ute tax, the Wolf tax, or yeah. the clean car standard. It's yeah. the one which is going to come into effect on first of January, twenty twenty three. So you're not just going to pay a Ute tax at the dealership. This government's going to put a tax on uh, vehicles, uh, petrol and diesel vehicles, arriving at the wharf from one January. It's going to be a double tax. Uh, we're going to vote against it. I'm not quite sure what my mates in the National Party are going to do. Uh, their leader was a bit confused on TV the other day about which tax he'd prefer. Act says, no you taxes, no way, never. All right. Oh, look, one other thing, Simon, and I don't think we've officially asked the Act Party. I think you have made a statement. Where are you guys on youth voting, on kids voting, the 16-year-old vote thing? Look, we think we should keep it 18 years old. Uh, 18 is a sensible age uh, where people have 
developed enough maturity to be able to go in the, into the polling booth um, and, and choose uh, who they might want to vote for. And look, we hear the argument for uh, bringing more people into it, you know, participating in democracy at 16. What we see in other countries like Austria when they changed it to 16, there's an initial wave of youth voting, but then it kind of drops off until they get into their late 20s for the simple reason that until you're a net taxpayer and you realise that you're paying more tax than services you're getting from the government, a young people's attention isn't that focused on voting and on political parties and policy. So we would say keep it 18. Uh, it's actually up to uh, the political parties to advocate better policy and explain it to young people um, rather than simply giving 16-year-olds uh, the vote. Yeah, well, I must say all the activists behind this whole campaign um, seem to be Green or Labour Party associated people. Well, they'll probably never be net taxpayers then, will they, Sean? <laughs> Simon, thank you very much. Isn't it nice heading into Christmas, mate, knowing that the world is not going to come to an end, though? That we were all just oh, look, overreacting. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that. when I go out and speak to people, particularly young people, and they ask what's X climate change policy, I say, look, we're just going to uh, uh, trust those big organisations, the energy companies, uh, trucking companies who are switching to dual fuel hydrogen diesel to actually get New Zealand's emissions down. Uh, we don't need to tax you. We don't need to ban things. This is happening through technology. And, and, and so I think that is a comforting message as we head into Christmas and fire up those barbecues, Sean. Good on you. Thank you very much indeed for your time. That is uh, Simon Court. He is the National pa uh, the Act Party, sorry, uh, energy or environment, or well, energy or environment, environmental spokesperson. Environment, climate spokesperson. Climate, same thing, environment, climate. Um, and once again, so they say, well, we were never too worried anyway in the ACT Party about the old climate change in the World Board. I thought he was having a bit of a bob each way, to be honest. No one wants to be too anti-greeny because it's the trendy thing. It's the corporately trendy thing. It's like being rainbow ticked or whatever. Oh, yeah, we're sustainable, man. Oh, absolutely.